So welcome everybody, happy Monday morning. Hope you all had a great weekend. So just to frame where we are and then get into what I think in this four part series about Zionism will be the most probably provocative class. Um, and I think for, for both good and bad uh, reasons, I think there's gonna be a lot of material in the next hour that I think will we'll shock and, and hopefully also challenge a lot of what we might think in both good and bad ways about what eventually would become the contemporary Israeli right. And so I think, you know, regardless of what people are coming in, if people are coming in with a, I'm a right-wing Israeli, hopefully this will challenge you in one way, if people are coming in saying, I don't understand why anybody would be a right-wing Zionist Israeli, hopefully this will challenge you from the other side, um, like all good materials do. So I am going to share my screen and go into a little bit of an overview of what we did the last two times, but this time through a little bit of history. So just for, for those who have been following along, the first two classes we did, the first one we did Herzl and his general project of political Zionism, and we talked a lot about that. Last session, we talked a lot about Achad Am and the rise of cultural Zionism and attempting to challenge let's say, the secularization of Zionism from a Jewish cultural perspective. And we spent a lot of time going through Achad Am or Asher Ginsburg's texts. And all of a sudden now, our next Zionistic philosophy is now going to be generation two. So one way to think of this is the early debates between political and revision, uh, sorry, between political and cultural Zionism, that was happening in the late 1800s, early 1900s. All of the sudden, where we're going to start off today in terms of our next ideology is really the 1920s post-World War I. Um, but just to fill in in about two minutes, because I really don't want to focus on history, I really want to focus a lot more about philosophy and ideology, because I think that is um, more generally interesting. Between 1881 and 1914, we saw a series of aliyot, and aliyah in Hebrew just means it literally means going up, but in the context of Israel and Zionism, it means going up and living in the land of Israel. And this map here is what the Yeshuv looked like both in 1881 and then also in 1914. So everybody here can read the statistics, but just to go over them again, in 1881, so really before any type of Zionistic activity, there was about half a million Arabs in the land and about 24,000 Jews. By 1914, again, this is generation two of Zionism, right? Herzl and the first Zionist Congress was 1897. So this is already almost 20 years later. Herzl has already, he, he was already dead at this point, right? So this is now generation two. There's still only about 85,000 Jews living in the land of Israel and still about half a million Arabs. And so the population of Jews tripled to some extent, but this wasn't the sort of, 10 million Jews living in the land of Israel that Herzl might have won, right? And so this is a um, just a map of the dark black are the major Jewish settlements, the open circles are the smaller Jewish settlements, and the squares are the um, major Arab towns. Um, and to some extent, for those who, who are deeply familiar with the current map of Israel, this shouldn't be very surprising because it's still generally holds true in terms of which cities in Israel and the modern day West Bank are predominantly Jewish, which ones are Arab and everything like that. And so this is again, what it would have looked like in 1914. And then all of a sudden we know what happens after 1914, we get World War I. And without, again, we're not gonna go too much into the history and how this happened, but after World War I, the entire Zionist pragmatic movement had to shift because pre-World War I, the owner of this entire land was the Ottoman Empire. And one of the ways in which virtually all Zionists, right, it didn't make a difference if you would eventually become a right-wing Zionist, a left-wing Zionist, a cultural Zionist, whatever Zionist, your predominant way of getting land was actually relatively simple during this time. And it was simple because the Ottoman Empire, who ruled the entirety of the Middle East, they were willing to sell for oftentimes hefty prices, land to the Zionist movement. And so the way in which the early Zionist movement obtained most of the land for these kibbutzim or yeshuvim or settlements, whatever word we want to use, 
was through purchasing. Now we can endlessly debate the ins and outs of the legitimacy of the Zionists showing up and purchasing land from the Ottoman Empire and then kicking out maybe Arab tenants or farmers that had been living there for five, six generations, right? That's a you know ethical question that will sideline for now. But all this is to say it was fairly simple what needed to happen pre-World War I. Because as long as the Ottoman Empire was continuously willing to sell land to the Zionist project, everybody was in agreement, right? I'm sure you had some small disagreements about exactly what should happen and where you should settle and all of that. But there was a fairly, there was, there was a unidirection of what needs to happen, right? We need to raise more money, right? A lot of the early Zionists became fundraisers. They would show up to New York and other places where a lot of wealthy Jews lived, and they would try to raise money for the purchasing of land. And American Jews, right, not much has changed in 100 years, who maybe themselves didn't want to bear the difficult journey of moving to the land of Israel and showing up on a kibbutz and draining a swamp, they were all too happy to write a check, even knowing that they would probably never themselves end up or maybe even visit Israel. All of a sudden, of course, this changes. And once World War I hits, we now start to get the beginning of a new dichotomy. Uh, and today's topic is mostly going to be about revisionist Zionism. Um, but before we go to revisionist Zionism, I wanted to highlight what at this point the dominant stream of Zionism was. And so for those who remember, two times ago, we talked a lot about Herzl and political Zionism. And labor Zionism, which we'll talk about in a second, can almost be seen as the natural outgrowth from Herzl's Zionism. And so we'll just take two minutes to go through labor Zionism. One, it was... Um, fundamentally socialist or, or Marxist. And this is in line, of course, with a lot of well-educated European Jews at the time. So there was nothing you know, surprising about labor Zionism being based on socialistic principles. Um, and of course, for those who are familiar, just to go back to this map, right, most of these early settlements were kibbutzim. And probably the only reason why Zionism worked in the early 1900s, even to mid 1900s, was because of the socialistic mindset of pooling resources, of doing whatever we need to do for the state. Um, and we'll see a quote about that in a second. And the dominant principle of labor Zionism, both pre and post Ottoman Empire, was that the way in which we're going to acquire statehood is through working the land. And so, again, it was a very labor centric mindset of saying, if you work the land for long enough, you grow roots in the land, and you will naturally have a state arise through that, and the rest of the world and the Arab neighbors are going to come to see that we have a legitimate right to this land. Perhaps you even want us, right? If you're an Arab farmer, you even want the Jews on this land because we are working it, we're making it better. Again, if you're approaching this from a purely socialistic or... Um, if you're approaching this from a purely socialistic or Marxist standpoint, you think that material concerns are the be all and end all of what needs to happen. And so in line with that thinking, if you are a Marxist Zionist, you might think, okay, you show up to the land of Israel, right? And I'm calling it land of Israel, not state of Israel, right? To distinguish, right? This is pre-statehood, but you show up to the land of Israel, you build some nice hospitals, you build the train station, you better you better material conditions for everybody. And of course, the Arabs that are living there are going to, ipso facto, because of that, welcome you with open arms. And so this is, again, the, the dominant mindset of labor Zionism. Again, we can you know talk about what they were correct about, what they were wrong about, what they might have been naive about, um, all of that. Um, I think someone just told me that the Facebook feed cut. Um, Madalena, I don't know if you're here and you could restream it. Hmm. Seems to be a uh, fun recurring Facebook issue. All right, give me two seconds. If anyone has any questions on this while I try to figure out this uh, Facebook streaming situation, let me know. Or you know what, we can just go and I think this is recorded elsewhere. Um, okay. It's recorded. Yeah, it's being recorded. I just don't think it's live on Facebook anymore. But either way, we can. Uh, Hi, Daniel. Yes, it's live. It's live. Okay, perfect. You know, according to Josh. 
Wonderful. Okay, I see it. Okay, perfect. Um, so in line again with um, with labor Zionist principles, they once the British took over, they were extremely happy to work with the British. And this is again going to be the next major one of the major tension points within Zionism, both of the year 1920 and I'll also put in the year 2020 is right. And I'm talking about modern times is how much do you try to work through the international community and how much do you in crude language say screw you international community we don't care what you say we're doing things our own way right so this was both a debate in the 1920s when the british took over right the labor zionists which at this point were the dominant modality of zionism once the british took over the mindset was okay great let's see what we need to do to have the british eventually hand us a state. Um, and this will obviously be contrasted with um, the opposite approach, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, we talked about this before, right? The idea of labor Zionism was eventual um, peaceful coexistence with Arabs, again, based off of very materialistic concerns. Um, and if we remember, I think two times ago, I mentioned Herzl's book, Old New Land. And in Herzl's book, he imagines a future state of Israel in which there is going to be peaceful coexistence with Arabs, how is that going to happen? Herzl doesn't exactly tell us how, but probably it has to do with the fact that if material conditions are better for everybody, of course the Arabs are going to just say, I'm so happy you're here. Now let's you know, create a state together. Um, and just one of my favorite quotes by uh, Joseph Trumpledore, who was again, an early labor Zionist, which I think really encapsulates the, the mindset and the philosophy of this sort of all in approach of the kibbutzim. Um, so he writes, what is a pioneer, right? One of the early, right, the, the early settlers were called chalutzim, pioneers. He says, is he a worker only? No, the definition includes much more. The pioneers should be workers, but that is not all. We need people who will be everything, everything that the land of Israel needs. A worker has his labor interests, a soldier his esprit de corps, a doctor and an engineer, their special inclinations. A generation of iron men, iron from which you can forge everything the national machinery needs. You need a wheel, here I am. A nail, a screw, a block, here, take me. You need a man to till the soil, I'm ready. A soldier, I am here. Policeman, doctor, lawyer, artist, teacher, water carrier, here I am. I have no form. I have no psychology. I have no personal feeling, no name. I am a servant of Zion, ready to do everything, not bound to do anything. I have only one aim, creation. So this, this quote is, is probably simultaneously beautiful and terrifying. Um, at least every time I go back to it, that, that's what I think. Uh, and, and I really think it encapsulates this fascinating um, intersection here of Marxism and, and nationalism to some extent, right? And, and you know, there's endless books written on this and we don't really have time to get into this, but this is a very interesting, generally, staunch nationalistic claims and staunch Marxist claims don't, don't mesh together super well, right? Their, their aims are different things. Here, this was Marxism in the attempt to create a state. And it's a very unique mixture, uh, perhaps, right? This is sort of my, my own uh, commentary on the side, so take it or leave it. This is also one of the most successful times in, in history where Marxism slash socialism actually worked to achieve something, right? Most scholars and historians, even if one doesn't, is not in love with socialism, the kibbutz movement and early Zionism probably would not have worked if it wasn't for this mindset. Um, and this mindset, of course, went to everything, right? Everybody was all in, right? Children were raised in children's homes, right? Not in the homes of their parents, right? They were sent to communal homes. There was no such thing as private property, right? If you needed a car for the day, you would go to the kibbutz and get a car, right? Nobody, everybody made the exact same amount of money, right? Nobody, right? Pure, really pure, socialistic type living. And this was, again, if we just go back to this um, map before, this was, again, the dominant philosophy, the labor Zionism that really created this map that we see here. Um, and of course, just before we um, finish labor Zionism, right, some famous labor Zionists who I would guess everybody here has heard of, right, um, Ben Gurion, the first prime minister of Israel, Golda Meir, the prime minister that took over in the late 60s, and Yitzhak Rabin, of course, the labor prime minister who was assassinated for Oslo in the 90s. And so again, this, if you think early 20th century Zionism, this is it, right? This is how 
a lot of the mechanisms and modalities that would eventually become the state of Israel were created. Um, before we move on, any thoughts or questions here before we now contrast to uh, his uh, Yeah, I have a question. Were any of these people listed below, Ben-Gurion, et cetera, was anyone running the country or each kibbutz was running itself and independent of all the other parts? Yeah, it's a great question. So a mixture of both. So there was there was a huge labor union and also the Histadrut, right? That was also in control of a lot of things. There was, right? So everything that we're talking about right now, I mean, it, I I did something a little unfair. So I'll, uh, I'll criticize myself for a second. These are all characters. Well, I mean, they obviously were alive before the state was founded, but once the state was founded, a lot of the con control switched, right? So everything we're talking about today is presumably before 1948. So there was a spirit of decentralization anyway. There was still a lot of a lot of pre-governmental government institutions, uh, if that makes sense, right? One of the things in which Zionism was especially um, successful at is actually creating the framework and institution for a government before there was actually a government to, to, to use any of it. And so this is true both in terms of labor unions, in terms of the economy, in terms of the precursor to the IDF, the Haganah. And so the answer is a little bit of both. There was a spirit of sort of every kibbutz does, does whatever, but there was also a spirit of if the head of the labor union or if the head of the JNF or something like that says, you know, this is what we need to do, there was there was a push in that direction. Um, but it was a little bit of, of the Wild West in terms of exactly where to go and where to plant new kibbutzim and, and all of that. So there definitely was a lot of uh, a, a lot of freedom that every individual kibbutz had and, and everything like that. But it, it is a great question. Thank you. Okay, so in into this um, into the situation, right? We we now begin to see a new philosophy um, start to formulate, and this this philosophy becomes known as revisionist Zionism. Um, and sort of like last time, I want to I really want to spend 10, 15 minutes tackling the the foundational text of revisionist Zionism because it's all good and well if I um, put some bullet points on a slide, but in order to really understand, I think the philosophy of Vladimir Jabotinsky, who was the founder of revisionist Zionism, um, we really have to dive into his foundational text, which includes a scathing rebuke of labor Zionism. But just before we go there, a little bit of an introduction into revisionist Zionism. So one, just in terms of the pragmatic goal of revisionist Zionism, and it was founded by, again, the Russian-born um, Zev Jabotinsky, the reason why I just called him Vladimir Jabotinsky is like a lot of good Zionists, he changed his name early in his life, from Vladimir, right, again, a very Russian sounding name to Zev, uh, which means wolf in Hebrew, right, a very strong sounding Hebraic name, which we discussed two times ago was very common in the early, in early Zionism, changing your name from something diasporic to something um, Hebraic. So the, one of the main fundamental difference, just that's, that's obvious, so you have to throw it out there, is that revisionist Zionism from the outset was interested in what's known as greater Israel. Um, and that's encapsulated in this map over here. Um, and one of the ways to think about this debate is that political Zionism and or labor Zionism's main focus was just on achieving statehood. And again, we discussed this with Herzl, why the main focus was just statehood. Herzl was even willing to consider other options, right? Um, for those who don't know what I'm talking about, see the first class. And then of course, um, Achad Am argues about what exactly that state should look like but Achad Am was also on the same page as, I'm not yet thinking in terms of geography. Zev Jabotinsky and Revision Zionism came on and they imagined based off of Jewish history, right? So there is some basis to this map. This is if you take all parts of Jewish history, especially throughout the Tanakh, and you come up with what the maximal borders was that Jews have ever owned throughout biblical history in terms of the surrounding area of Israel, this is the map that you get, which obviously, right, Israel is this tiny sliver in the middle here. So this is, you know, 25, 30 times the size of what Israel even is now. And so this is obviously, right, we can endlessly debate how pragmatic this was, how non-pragmatic this was. Um, again, this is before, just important to throw out there, this is before a lot of the surrounding nation states were founded. 
So this map of greater Israel was come up with before the modern nation state of Jordan, right? So there was a time right after the British took over, the British obviously um, created the British mandate Palestine, and that was on both banks of the Jordan. And so while today this map looks absolutely insane, right, in terms of anybody who would still advocate for Israel looking like this, which maybe there are a handful of people, but even anybody on the Israeli right who's approaching this with, with some um, with some attempts of, uh, of normalcy, right? Nobody actually wants this map anymore or thinks it's gonna happen. But in the early 1900s, this was a lot more of a theoretical possibility in terms of um, this map overlaid on a lot of modern nation states. And so Zev Jabotinsky was from the outset he spent a lot of time growing up, right? Like a lot of um, Russian Jews in the late 1800s, early 1900s, he experienced a lot of anti-Semitism. And early on, he um, started to crystallize his philosophy that the only way to protect Jews is not just through statehood, but is through uh, weaponry or, or military might. And this is going to, again, be one of the major debates that's going to take place between labor and revisionism is the use of military force. Um, and the reason why I, I said that, I, you know, to some extent, I think everybody here hopefully will, will be made a little bit uncomfortable is while the traditional story, I would say, of Zionism is that labor Zionism eventually molded into the state and revisionist Zionism was sort of there along for the ride, but never really took control until maybe the 70s. Really, I think the history is a lot more complicated than that. And probably without revisionist Zionism and the philosophy of revisionist Zionism, there might never have been a state of Israel, which is, we can get into that in about 20 minutes um, once we understand it a little bit better. Um, but Zeb Jabotinsky, um, he uh, founded a group called the Zion Mule Corps. And that was a group that fought alongside Britain in World War I against the Ottoman Empire. And so you can already just sort of get a sense for who he was, right? Thinking that we need to be where the action is happening and Jews and especially Zionists need to fight and enter into military exchanges, especially when it's going to help us. Um, and he also, by the way, I, I don't think I have this in the uh, notes here, but one of the things in which Zev Jabotinsky is credited with is in the early 1930s to mid 1930s, warning the Jews of Poland that they're in grave danger. And he was basically laughed out of the room repeatedly. Um, and again, you know, obviously the Holocaust starting in the in the late 30s, he was there four or five years earlier begging people to move to the land of Israel and to join the Zionist movement. And there was actually hit pieces you can still read a lot of times written by, you know, again, uh, well assimilated secular Jews in Poland, basically laughing him out of the room. And so he's a very complicated figure. Um, just one one quote about him that I think, again, um, continues off of what we were talking about two times ago about the Zionist attempt to create the new Jew, he, he takes this even a little bit further. So just, um, just to read this, I, I really like this quote because you can see that he um, intermingles a lot of uh, biblical and Talmudic phrases into his writing, which, which again, compared to political Zionism and labor Zionism that didn't want much to do with Jewish tradition and Jewish history, revisionist Zionism attempted to go back to an earlier stage of Jewish history, right? For anybody who opens up the Tanakh or the Hebrew Bible, there's a lot more stories about war than when you open up most other pieces of Jewish literature. And so another way to think of this is you can read all 2000 whatever pages of Talmud and you get maybe a tiny discussion here and there about warfare. If you open up the Hebrew Bible, half of it is battles and wars and things like that. And so again, if you are attempting to establish a state, especially if you're attempting to establish a state based off of the doctrine that you need military and might, you're going to draw from, from that and you're going to attempt to have a revisionist view towards Jewish history. Um, but just to read this quote here. So he says, to imagine what a true Hebrew is, to picture in our minds, we have no example from which to draw. We must use the method of ipcha mistabra, right? Which is one of the terms that the Talmud uses whenever it can't prove a point. So it attempts to prove a point from imagining the opposite. So he says, we take as our starting point, the yid of today and try to imagine in our minds his exact opposite. Let us erase from that picture all personality traits that are so typical of a yid, 
and let us insert into it all the desirable traits whose absence is so typical in him. Because the Yid is ugly, sickly, and lacks handsomeness, we shall endow the ideal image of the Hebrew with masculine beauty, stature, massive soldiers, vigorous movements, bright colors, and the shades of color. The Yid is frightened and downtrodden. The Hebrew ought to be proud and independent. The Yid is disgusting to all. The Hebrew should charm all. The Yid has accept submission. The Hebrew ought to know how to command. The Yid likes to hide with bated breath from the eyes of strangers. The Hebrew with brazenness and greatness should march ahead to the entire world, look them straight and deep in their eyes and hoist them his banner, I am a Hebrew. Obviously a lot to say about this quote. I think this was in the early 1900s. So this is before he was officially the head of any movement. He was probably writing this. Um, this was actually pre-World War I. Um, and again, we can probably, you know, we can of course spend the next hour talking just about this quote, just a couple of, of things, right? There's obviously a lot of um, internalized anti-Semitism in this quote, right? I think that is beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, on the other hand, to play devil's advocate, and you know, my my hopeful goal by in, in the next 45 minutes is for nobody here to have any clue what I think about any of these texts to try to present them both in the uh, defense and uh, and criticizing them, is if this is the way that the rest of the world, right? What I imagine Jabotinsky would say is if this is the way that the rest of the world thinks about Jews, we need to do something to change it. After all, Zionism was a movement that was based off of the rest of the world hates us. What do we need to do in order to solve it? And his way to solve it was basically to say, okay, we have you know, the image of the diasporic Jew away with that, right? No more are Jews going to be seen as the sort of meek pushovers. And we are going to be seen as strong, Hebraic, muscular, right? Military, right? Everything that, again, I think modern day Israel has sort of evolved into in terms of the image that it's trying to um, project to the rest of the world. Um, alongside this view, and then we'll get into the, uh, the, the text in a minute, um, revision of Zionism was also extremely anti-socialist. And this was, would again be another major debate in the history of Zionism and subsequent Israel, that the labor Zionist movement was not just themselves socialist, but in terms of international politics, they were allied with the socialist and Marxist cause up until a certain point. Again, we can debate exactly when that point was, but the early labor movement was aligned in a lot of ways with the Soviet Union. And it was only really until the 60s, maybe even the 70s, that the last support for the Soviet Union ended as the Soviet Union became increasingly anti-Semitic. And the revision Zionist camp was never a favor of socialism. And they were always trying to ally themselves with national, with more nationalistic entities. Sure, that includes America. It also includes some places that we might be a little bit more surprised. Um, it includes Hungary. It includes um, Mussolini and Italy, right before World War II. Jabotinsky and Mussolini were actually good friends. Um, and one, your, your fun fact for today is that um, Mussolini actually uh, gave Jabotinsky the funds for what would eventually and still is the Israeli Navy. And so, right, if anybody wants to see how complicated it is to peel back all of these pieces and to figure out what was happening in the 1930s, right, Mussolini, of course, allied with Hitler in World War II, funded the eventual Israeli Navy. And um, so just to throw that out there, um, this revision of Zionists would eventually become the Irgun, right? Hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about that a little bit more, right? We talked about Greater Israel and the um, revision of Zionist camp eventually founded really two parties. The first was called Heirut, and then eventually that evolved into Likud. And some, of course, famous Likudniks was Menachem Begin, who was the Israeli prime minister elected in the third, sorry, in the 70s. But then, of course, right, Benjamin Netanyahu has been the longest serving prime minister of Israel's history. And this is the um, philosophic camp that he comes from, obviously, right, even he, I don't think, would agree unto this uh, um, greater Israel, right, Ariel Sharon is another famous prime minister. And of course, uh, we all know Bibi. So um, Let's go here. I'm going to do one more um, quick historical thing. There's the problem is really there's there's too too much material here, but that's a good thing. It's better that there be too much than uh, for me to sit here being like I don't know what what should be next. Um, okay, so just to continue along the, the history a little bit, and we're not going to go through um, through all of this. Is that once the British mandate was formed, right? You can have a nice map of the British mandate here. 
It was formed in 1920. And it was a time now, and you can see this uh, population graph over here, that right when the British mandate formed, there was a lot of immigration, both by Jews and by Arabs. And so, right, we can endlessly debate as to why exactly, right, perhaps material concerns were better. There was a lot of displacement in the Middle East post-World War I because of colonialism, right, all of those ideas um, taken for granted. Um, but there was increased both Jews and Arabs in the land. And of course, this created the uh, tinderbox for the 1920 and 1921 Arab riots. And this was really the first time, right, if you're trying to find, if you're trying to pinpoint the origins of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, there's a lot of uh, good contenders. 1920 is probably one of the better contenders because this is at a time when, again, this was a, a bottom-up riot situation. So this isn't like, you know, it's not like you had one leader of the Arab world saying, go riot against the kibbutzim, but all over the place you had these sporadic riots and the kibbutzim were being attacked. And in return, the kibbutzim said, hey, we need our own defense. So the labor Zionist union formed the Haganah. The Haganah in Hebrew just means the defense. It's the precursor to the IDF. And so you have the situation where now you have the Arabs that are becoming increasingly upset at increased Jewish immigration and the labor Zionists who were the group that were in the beginning, the most opposed to violence, right? They were socialist, agriculturalists, right? They wanted to make the land better and everyone would live happily ever after. Even to some extent, they are biting the bullet and saying, you know what? We need to form a defense force and everything like that. So onto this scene steps Jabotinsky again, and give me two seconds, and pens the famous and or infamous, depending on uh, what your views are, um, essay called The Iron Wall. And this was written um, in 1923. So really right after these um, early riots when everybody was trying to figure out what to do. And um, this is actually, it's not nearly as long of an essay as Akhara Am, so don't worry. Um, but I think we can probably get through a good amount of it even in, in 10 minutes. So here is how he begins his essay. It is an excellent rule to begin an article with the most important point. But this time I find it necessary to begin with an introduction and moreover with a personal introduction. I am reputed to be an enemy of the Arabs who wants to have them ejected from Palestine and so forth. It is not true. Emotionally, my attitude to the Arabs is the same as to all other nations, polite indifference. Politically, my attitude is determined by two principles. First of all, I consider it utterly impossible to eject the Arabs from Palestine. There will always be two nations in Palestine, which is good enough for me, provided the Jews become the majority. And secondly, I belong to the group that once drew up the Helsing for program, the program of national rights for all nationalities living in the same states. In drawing up that program, we had in mind not only the Jews, but all nations everywhere, and its basis is equality of rights. I am prepared to take an oath, binding ourselves and our descendants, that we shall never do anything contrary to the principle of equal rights, and that we shall never try to eject anyone. This seems to me a fairly peaceful credo. But it is another question whether it is always possible to realize a peaceful aim by peaceful means. For the answer to this question does not depend on our attitude to the Arabs, but entirely on the attitude of the Arabs to us and Zionism. Now, after this introduction, we may proceed to the subject. There can be no voluntary agreement between ourselves and the, Palest and the Palestine Arabs, not now nor in the prospective future. I say this with such conviction, not because I want to hurt the moderate Zionists. I do not believe that they will be hurt, except for those who are born blind. They realized long ago that it is utterly impossible to obtain the voluntary consent of the Palestine Arabs for converting Palestine from an Arab country into a country with a Jewish majority. So again, just to uh, summarize real quick in this paragraph, he is attacking directly the, the main philosophy of labor Zionism and their approach to what to do in terms of this conflict that's brewing, the labor Zionist approach, at least before 1920s, but even carrying on, of course, post 1920s, is eventually they will come around. Eventually, the Arabs will come to see that we're not here as a threatening force, that we want to be friends, that we don't hate them, et cetera, et cetera. And he is directly attacking 
perhaps one of the most foundational principles, again, not just of labor Zionism, you can also see a critique in here of, of the very idea of Marxism itself, because if all that really matters is materialistic concerns, then the labor Zionists should be correct about the future of coexistence with the Arabs. You bolster materialistic concerns for everybody and everybody's happy, right? Marxism generally um, reduces nationalism to be not a primary force, but just reducible to economic concern, right? So he continues to, to write, um, my readers have a general idea of the history of colonial of colonization in other countries. I suggest that they consider all the precedents with which they are acquainted and see whether there is one solitary instance of any colonial colonization being carried on with the consent of the native population. There is no such precedent. The native population, civilized or uncivilized, have always stubbornly resisted the colonists, irrespective of whether they were civilized or savage. And it made no difference whether the colonists behaved decently or not, right? He gives some examples. He says, yet the native population fought with the same ferocity with the good colonists uh, as against the bad, right? So he's saying it doesn't matter how well you treat a native population if you show up for the outside and start to um, exert political or whatever power, you're going to meet resistance. Every native population regards its land as its national home of which it is the sole master. And it wants to retain that mastery always. It will refuse to admit not only new masters, but even new partners or collaborators, right? So again, saying very straightforward, a couple things that labor Zionists seem to not really be taking into account. One, that Arabs are there, right? They exist, which there, there were some elements of early labor Zionism that basically out of sight, out of mind, right? Let's not worry about this. Jabotinsky in 1923 is already ringing the bell and saying, you know, we have a problem that's brewing here, right? This is going to end up a little bit worse than just a couple of riots here and there on the kibbutzim and maybe, you know, a couple people are killed, right? This, this could end badly or will end badly. Um, is what he's saying, and it doesn't really matter what we do. The very fact that we are here means that this is going to end badly. Um, so he continues, he says, this is equally true of the Arabs, our peacemongers, right, a great term, our peacemongers are trying to persuade us that the Arabs are either fools who we can deceive by masking our real aims, or that they are corrupt and can be bribed to abandon to us their claim to priority in Palestine, in return for cultural and economic advantages. I repudiate this conception of the Palestinian Arabs. Culturally, they are 500 years behind us. They have neither our endurance nor our determination, but they are just as good psychologists as we are, and their minds have been sharpened like ours by centuries of fine spurn legamachi, legamachi. I actually don't actually know that word. Um, we may tell them whatever we like about the innocence of our aims, watering them down and sweetening them with honeyed words to make them palatable, but they know what we want as well as we know what they do not want. They feel the same instinctive jealous love of Palestine as the old Aztecs felt for ancient Mexico and their Seox for the rolling prairies. So again, he, he's doing a couple of things that I just find important to highlight. One, again, he's utterly rejecting the peaceful labor Zionist approach because he thinks it's naive, right? That part he was certainly right about, um, right? In terms of the labor Zionist approach being um, naive in terms of what they were trying to accomplish. He does another thing here, which I think is interesting, which is in modern day Israel, there is a, a big debate often about when the conception of Palestinian nationhood arose. And some of the answers given are maybe after 1948, maybe after 1967. Jabotinsky's writing in the early 1920s saying, there is an indigenous people here. We need to think about that. <laughs> Right, and we need to think about that in, in in a serious way. And so Jabotinsky, what what comes out, and you know, we'll read a little bit more. We're about halfway done this this essay here. Jabotinsky is a serious moral thinker, um, and what I mean by that is he, wh whatever one thinks about his ideas, and we can discuss his ideas in a second. He oftentimes, I think, is is pigeonholed um, in, in conversations today as even the way that he introduces his uh, essay by saying, "Oh, he was the one who wanted to kick out all the Arabs." Um, one of the things that one gets when, when reading Jabotinsky is he understood the nationalistic conflict between Zionism and, and Palestinian nationhood about 60 years before anybody else really thought about this in a critical way. And 
he, he thought this was a serious moral problem to deal with. And one of the things that I think goes to his credit, and then you know we can knock and discuss his solutions all we want, is he wasn't willing to reduce the Arabs in Palestine to basically a, um, I'm trying to think, to almost a robotic actor who would bow to whatever the Zionist movement threw at them, right? He, he really did understand the seriousness of what happens when you're trying to establish a state on a land in which there are two peoples, right? And he really took that seriously. Also under the rubric, right, he was to a large extent a, a liberal in terms of his idea about equal rights. And as I think he notes in his um, essay earlier, he was actually part of projects in Europe trying to advocate for minorities, aka Jews, to have equal rights in countries where they were clearly not the cultural or nationalistic majority. And so he was no stranger to a lot of the complexities here. Um, so he, he says, to imagine as our Arab files do, that they will willingly consent to the realization of Zionism in return through the moral and material conveniences which the Jewish colonists bring with them is a childish notion which has at bottom a kind of contempt for the Arab people. It means that they despise the Arab race which they regard as a corrupt mob that can be bought and sold and are willing to give up their fatherland for a good railway system. And so he says, again, straight up, this is not going to work. Stop thinking that you can throw some nice things at the Arabs in Palestine and they are going to decide, okay, you're right, um, let's just move away. Um, and so, bum, bum, bum. so let's just skip um, this small next section. And so, okay, so he says, some of us, and here, this is, I, I think, a very fascinating um, part of the essay here. He says, some of us have induced ourselves to believe that all the trouble is due to misunderstanding. The Arabs have not understood us, and that is the only reason why they resist us. If we can only make it clear to them how moderate our intentions really are, they will immediately extend to us their hand in friendship, right? This is a view that you hear all the time within the, the pro-Israel Zionist community of, uh, we're just not explaining ourselves good enough, right? The Arabs don't really understand that we're not here to cause them harm. They don't really understand what it means, the whole history of Israel and Zionism and all of that. He says, this belief is utterly unfounded and has, it has been exploded again and again. I shall recall one instance of many. A few years ago, when the late Mr. Sakwa was on one of his periodic visits to Palestine, he addressed a meeting on this very question of the misunderstanding. He demonstrated lucidly and convincingly that the Arabs are terribly mistaken if they think that we have any desire to deprive them of their possessions or to drive them out of their country or that we want to oppress them. We do not even ask for a Jewish government to hold the mandate of the League of Nations. One of the Arab papers, El Carmel, replied at the time in an editorial article, the purport of which was this. The Zionists are making a fuss about nothing. There is no misunderstanding. All that Mr. Sokolow says about the Zionist intention is true, but the Arabs know that without him. Of course, the Zionists cannot now be thinking of driving the Arabs out of the country or oppressing them, nor do they contemplate a Jewish government. Quite obviously, they are now concerned with the one thing only, that the Arabs should not hinder their immigration. The Zionists assure us that even immigration will be regulated strictly according to the economic needs of Palestine. The Arabs have never doubted that. It is a truism, for otherwise there can be no immigration. This Arab editor was actually willing to agree that Palestine has a very large potential absorption capacity, meaning that there is room for a great many Jews in the country without displacing a single Arab. There is only one thing the Zionists want, and that is the one thing the Zionists don't want, for that is the way by which Jews would gradually become the majority, and then a Jewish government would follow automatically, and the future of the Arab minority would depend on the goodwill of the Jews. And a minority status is not a good thing as the Jews themselves are never tired of pointing out. So there is no misunderstanding. The Zionists want only one thing, Jewish immigration, and this Jewish immigration is what the Arabs do not want. So he says, at the root of this conflict, there is a, there, there's no misunderstanding. It's very black and white, according to Jabotinsky. The way to fulfill the Zionist project is more Jews in this land, and the one thing the Arabs do not want is more Jews in this land, right? So he's, again, reducing the conflict, right? Forget all of the fancy discussions of peace talks and all of this, right? This is a zero-sum game, to some extent, in Jabotinsky's words, between two different peoples, perhaps, 
And I, I, I might be reading it a little bit to Jabotinsky, but I would argue he would agree with the statement if he was here, two different peoples that have completely just claims to what they're about to do, but they can't both win. So he says, the statement of the position by the Arab editor is so logical, so obvious, so indisputable that everyone ought to know it by heart. And it should be made the basis of all future discussions on the Arab question. It does not matter at all which phraseology we employ in explaining our colonialistic aims. Colonization carries its own explanation, the only possible explanation, unalterable and as clear as daylight to every ordinary Jew and, ordi and ordinary Arab. Colonization can only have one aim and Palestine Arabs cannot accept this claim. It lies in the very nature of things and in this particular regard, nature cannot be changed. So he lays out his problem and we're about to get to his solution, which is um, a lot shorter than his problem. Oftentimes it's e a lot easier to uh, lay out a, a good problem than a solution. So his problem, again, very straightforward. Everybody is being naive. The labor Zionists, right? Their entire methodology of interaction with the local population. And I'll also add at, at other times, this philosophy is extended to also the um, the British world, right? The British government also, because one of the things in which revisionist Zionists did throughout the 1920s and 1930s is become increasingly hostile towards the British who were in the land, right? So just uh, one, one quick tangent here, because I think it'll be interesting. And then we'll get back to his answer of what to do with the, um, with the Arabs is there was a big debate between labor and revisionism. Once the British mandate took over, they issued the Balfour Declaration even before the British mandate Palestine, laying the groundwork for Britain eventually giving a Jewish state. And the labor Zionists were happy to work within that paradigm. And even after the British were waiting 10, 15, 20, 30, almost um, 30 years between the Balfour Declaration and issuing a mandate, labor government was very patient and saying, well, we just need more political advocacy and we just need more convincing this. And at a certain point, revision Zionism said, the British are just as much our enemies as anybody else. And the revision of Zionism started carrying out minor terrorist attacks against British and everything like that. And so again, this, this philosophy is not just the Zionists versus Palestinians. This is also very much his philosophy in general, again, reducible to a, a doctrine about the importance and centrality of, of military power. So, here is why his essay was called The Iron Wall, and it's become a very uh, famous and or infamous uh, phrase in modern Israeli politics. So he says, we cannot offer any adequate compensation to the Palestine Arabs in return to Palestine. And therefore, there is no likelihood of any voluntary agreement being reached. So that all those who regard such an agreement as a condition sine qua non for Zionism may as well say non and withdraw from Zionism. So he says, if you are a Zionist because you think we are going to solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in whatever, right, this is far before anybody wanted to use the language of two states, but today you can, you know, you can use this to criticize, right, uh, a liberal Zionist um, stance, which says, well, I'm a liberal Zionist, I'm just waiting for there to be a two-state solution. Jabotinsky would say, you should stop because that is not going to happen, right? It is by definition um, impossible. Zionist colonization must either stop or else proceed regardless of the native population, which means that it can proceed and develop only under the protection of a power that is independent of the native population, behind an iron wall which the native population cannot breach. That is our Arab policy, not what we should be, but what it actually is, whether we admit it or not. What need otherwise of the Balfour Declaration or of the mandate? Their value to us is that their power has undertaken to create in the country such conditions of administrations and security that if the native population should desire to hinder our work, they shall find it impossible. And we are, all of us, without any exception, demanding day after day that this outside power should carry out the task vigorously and without determination. In this matter, there is no difference between our militarists and our vegetarians, again, a pejorative term for the labor Zionists, except that the first prefer that the iron wall should consist of Jewish soldiers and the others are content that they should be British. This is an important line. We'll get back to it in a second. Um, and we're almost done here. We all demand that there should be an iron wall, yet we keep spoiling our own case by talking about agreement, which means telling the mandatory government the kind of things that is not the iron wall, but discussions. 
MK rhetoric of this kind is dangerous. And that is why it is not only a pleasure, but a duty to discredit it and to demonstrate that it is both fantastic and dishonest. Just the last um, couple lines here, two brief remarks. In the first place, if anyone objects that this point of view is immoral, I answer, it is not true. Either Zionism is moral and just, or it is immoral and unjust. But that it is a question we should have settled before we became Zionists. Actually, we have settled that question, and in the affirmative. We hold that Zionism is moral and just. And since it is moral and just, justice must be done, no matter whether Joseph or Simon or Ivan or Ahmed agree with it or not. There is no other morality. In the second place, this does not mean that there cannot be any agreement with the Arabs. What is impossible is a voluntary agreement. As long as the Arabs feel that there is the least hope of getting rid of us, they will refuse to give up this hope in return for either kind words or for bread and butter, because they are not a rabble, but a living people. And when a living people yields in matter of such vital character, it is only when there is no longer any hope of getting rid of us because they can make no breach in the iron wall. Not till then will they drop their extremist leaders whose watchwords is never. And the leadership will pass to the moderate groups who will approach us with a proposal that we should both agree to mutual concessions. Then we may expect them to discuss honest practical questions, which as a guarantee against Arab displacement or equal rights for Arab citizens or Arab national integrity. And when that happens, I am convinced that we Jews will be found ready to give them satisfactory guarantees so that both people can live together in peace like good neighbors. But the only way to obtain such an agreement is the iron wall, which is to say a strong power in Palestine that is not amenable to any Arab pressure. In other words, the only way to reach an agreement in the future is to abandon all idea of seeking an agreement at present. Okay, so I wanna say two, two quick things about this, and then I would love to uh, have a discussion, love to hear thoughts, right? Obviously there's a lot of material there. Um, I'll say two comments um, in no particular order. Um, one is that in general, I think he's pointing out a hypocrisy of, of liberalism to some extent. Um, and this is um, a, a two thirds baked idea. So if you uh, agree or disagree with what I'm about to say, uh, you know that goes for everything, but call me out on it. I, I think one of the things that he's trying to argue, and this can even hold true for let's say liberals living in America today, is that a lot of times we, have empty platitudes and words about peace and all of these nice terms, but really we're just hiring other people to do the dirty work behind us. So whether that dirty work be, you know, whatever a, a nation state needs to function, right? America obviously has a military and a police force and all of these other groups that if probably every single day you had to wake up and read everything the American military did to keep us safe every morning, that would probably make a lot of us feel uncomfortable, yet we're all too happy knowing that while we're asleep at night, the American military is going all throughout the world to keep us safe. And so he's pointing out in terms of the liberal Zionists, he's saying, they, if you actually look at what they're doing, they agree with us. They're just hiring, the, they're just content with the British doing it, right? At this point, the British were the ones keeping calm in the area. And he's saying, okay, great, liberal Zionists, they're saying, they want peace and no war and let's just, you know, agriculture and work the land. In reality, they're the ones backing the British government who are the ones conducting night raids into Palestinian villages and stopping future terrorist attacks. He's saying, okay, great. So what, why don't we just do that, right? If Zionism is after all a movement of Jewish autonomy, that means everything. It doesn't just mean we get to sit around work the land and maybe, you know, Sukkot is a day off instead of Easter, that means everything. That means we have to do the dirty work of creating a nation state just like everybody else. So that, that's one thing that he's pointing out um, a lot of this hypocrisy to the idea that he gets to at the end, I think is a fascinating idea because it's been the, the cornerstone of much of the right versus left debate in Israel over the past hundred years, um, which is, do you make, or I'll, I'll phrase it in the negative. Is, no, I'll phrase it positive. Does it make more sense to make peace through peace or peace through strength? 
And this is an extremely important debate that's been happening throughout Israel's history, where this is going to be a generalization, but I, I think it holds true. The labor Zionist slash the left's view is you lead with peace, and then that obviously is going to create a peaceful situation. Jabotinsky, again, knocks this, and he says the way to create peace is not to lead with peace. The way to lead with peace is to put up an iron wall, right? Again, this is a metaphor. The metaphor of an iron wall is that nothing can get through it, right? And so you spend 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, however, long, however many years it takes, you put up this protective shield around Israel and Zionism to the point where everybody, after all, realizes, okay, Israel's not going anywhere, and then peace will come very easily. Now, one, one thing I'll say about that is Jabotinsky's position is, is, is very morally um, difficult to digest. I will say from a historical point of view, um, one of the seeming ironies of Israel history, which once we understand the philosophy of the right in Israel becomes a lot less surprising, is that every time Israel has actually traded a land for peace, it's been a right-wing leader. So it was Menachem Begin who after the Yom Kippur War, he gave the Sinai back to Egypt in return for peace. It was Ariel Sharon who pulled out of, of the Gaza Strip, right? And so there could be, right, Jabotinsky is not, as is constantly thought of, anti-peace. He just thinks that the way for peace is to be realistic about it. We can disagree about whether or not he's correct in that diagnosis, but he also wants the future of Israel and Arabs to be a peaceful coexistence. He just thinks the only way to get there is to be realistic about the zero-sum game. We have to win the zero-sum game, and only after will there be a um, a type of peace that comes out of that. Okay, would love to hear any thoughts, questions, comments, um, criticisms, anything like that. And I see somebody wrote a comment um, that his paper has an internal contradiction. Um, Number one, Jews must be um, opposed to negotiations with Arab neighbors and ruthless. And two, Howard, what, what is number two? All right, while we're waiting for- uh, Here, I'll just, there. I'll just tell you, I was- Yeah, go for it. This two is during the time of this ruthless iron wall, there's gonna inevitably be destruction large scale destruction of Palestinian Arab property and uh, uh, killing people and expelling them or you know taking over property and so forth um, uh, to make room for the for the uh, settlements. Uh, and hopefully all this is inflicted by the iron wall, but he wants the iron wall to be Jewish um, Jewish soldiers okay so that, Inevitably, they will, Palestinian Arabs will associate all this destruction with Jews coming in. Okay, they're not going to be able to deflect it onto the British, right? If you have Jewish soldiers doing it, certainly. And even if you did, they know that the Jews are behind it. So you're going to end up with this complete history of absolute hatred of Jews for Arabs. And then at the end, three, we're going to have a negotiation and peaceful coexistence. I don't see it. So you're correct. His version of peaceful coexistence is, I'll say this very crudely, um, once, because of what you're saying, the Arabs have given up any sense of nationhood or, or any, right? It's almost, you know, they've been made, they, they realize that, it makes no sense to continuously push. And so only then you'll have exit, you know, peace through strength. And again, he 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 he's a complicated person because again, right, he also was a fan of greater Israel, right? So he wanted Israel to be a much bigger area than it was. So within that nation state, and this is important to say, he was pro-equal rights for everybody who lived there. Right. So he was not thinking of an apartheid system where you had Jews and then you had Arabs as second class citizens who, you know, couldn't do X, Y and Z. This was purely when he's describing this was a nationalistic battle. He says that the Jewish nationalism, Zionism needs to utterly defeat Palestinian nationalism. And then afterwards, only through that. Right. Once Palestinian nationalism 
eventually, right, however long it takes, realizes that no matter what it does, it's futile, then you can have peaceful coexistence because, okay, great, there'll be a state, it'll be a Jewish state, and everybody will, you know, maybe live, hopefully, have hopefully live happily ever after. Um, that, that was more his program than it was thinking that Arabs are going to come around to the idea of Zionism. I don't know if that answers no, that. No, exactly, kind of exactly. But but the problem is that's simply not real. Nobody, that isn't the way, it, what you're going to have is one of two things. You're going to have eternal hatred in which they never come around. Yes, you implacably oppose them. Yes, you bring in the immigrants. Yes, you have a state, but they're going to just wipe it out. They're going to still want to wipe it out even after it's a state because they're so traumatized. And so they'll be traumatized, but they'll be traumatized into political and military action to relieve their trauma, right? What Jabotinsky is arguing is the other alternative, which is, in effect, They'll be so traumatized that they'll be helpless. They'll be hopeless. They'll be so depressed. They'll be so demoralized that they will accept. We, they will basically accept any guarantees. What did I just do? Yeah, no, you're 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 entirely right, and I think I think that's that's a very reasonable critique. Like I I, I don't I mean again I I you know don't want to share any of my personal views, but I think. In terms of attacking Jabotinsky, that's that that's exactly the right critique. I mean, that's that's exactly what you can imagine the the labor Zionists saying back to him is that you're just going to exacerbate an endless conflict that's never going to end, right? To or some if extent, you're successful, yeah. They you will, or if you're successful, you'll end up with Arabs being second class citizens because the temptation to treat them that way will be so obvious because they will be so demoralized that they will accept any denigration that you do. Yeah, and so, yeah, you're right. It'll be easy for them to, to, to negotiate with them once they're completely shattered and have no other choice. But yeah, is no, that you're, you're, you're entirely you right. Know? And, and it, his, whole, his whole philosophy rests on the premise that the, I mean, he even says this at the outset, the, the ends justify the means. Right. Meaning he's, he, he's saying, Given that, right, his argument is as follows. Given that Zionism is moral and just, and again, he's taking that as a as an assumption, right? Obviously, you know, people can agree or disagree with that claim, but given that Zionism is moral and just, and given that the only way to actually make Zionism work is to acknowledge the obvious fact that there's another people here that are not going to go away if we throw some nice hospitals and railroads at them, then the only thing that we can do is be much stronger than them, right? And 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 win this conflict. And then afterwards, right, almost peace. I, I don't think, Howard, his main philosophy is getting towards peace. I think he just says that at the end, and, and again, I, I think he believes it, but I, I, I think that that's almost an, an afterthought. I think yeah. for him, it's, we need to do whatever we can to achieve Zionism. The labor Zionists are being wholly unrealistic and about what it takes. This is what it's really gonna take um, take it or leave it. I want to go, Sylvia, did you have? Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I agree with all that. But I also think that um, um, he sounds to me like he really understood the tenets of colonialism and what you do to colonize a people or a country, because that's what he's saying. Um, I think he might have learned it from the Brits and that's why they didn't like them so much because that's what the Brits are doing, you know, but he wanted to do the same thing, but he didn't want to say it. Mm, that's another good way. Yeah. Yeah. Again, he's, he's totally, I mean, this is right. Jabotinsky is interesting because he gets quoted a, a lot, right? The, the two people who are most likely to talk about Jabotinsky are hardline right wing right wingers in Israel, right? Um, people who vote for Bibi and Likud and people who want to discredit Zionism and, you know, staunch anti-Zionists because they say, see, this is what Zionism is, Zionism's colonialism. Right. So so it you're you're right. And he was, again, you know, there's there's a couple of ways to think about this, right? He totally was borrowing from the playbook of of European colonialism. I mean, so was so is labor Zionism to a point as well. I mean, again, they, you know, people are are not able to be fully detached from the societies that they're in. And so this was the framework to, you know, 
there was only one framework <clears throat> in Europe in the 1900s for showing up to a new place, setting up shop, and creating governmental institutions. And so it, it's not it's not surprising that he uses the word, you know, the framework of colonialism. I, I would say again, if if he was going to defend himself, he would say the methods that we used were colonialistic methods, but the original intent of the entire thing was not a colonialistic intent. In other words, right, I mean, this is beyond obvious, but obviously the, much of European colonialism was to go out, pillage, plunder, and enrich a mother country. This was not that at all. This was the way in which Jabotinsky, and I would argue, right, virtually any Zionist would frame what they were doing and the way in which Zionists today frame what Israel is, is this is a return to an ancient homeland and the return is just being helped by the methods of colonialism. And, and so I, I think that's that's where the difference is. And that's where both, I mean, again, I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll um, share a little bit of my own frustration because I, I, you know, I have so many conversations on, on campus and around the world about like, is Zionism colonialism by, you know, and to some extent it's the wrong question because let's say it is, so what, right? Like, I, I don't mean to say that flippantly, but like, either right the the exact methods that were used i mean this is one of the points that jabotinsky makes also that maybe i agree with is that there there are times especially when you're dealing with nationhood and and nationalities that a lot of times even if we don't want to admit it our philosophy is that the ends justify the means and it, it it's always hard jabotinsky says to admit that in the moment but years later people will be will be happy that 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 happened and so again, it, he he puts he puts a a very realist view of Zion. Right, it's very hard to be a uh, a a Zionist who doesn't think critically about what Zionism is doing once you read Jabotinsky, because the labor Zionists very much sugarcoat everything that's happening, and they try to portray you know everything here is you know fine and dandy and great, and oh for some reason even though there are such nice farms everywhere you know this radical Arab, you know, population doesn't like us. So they attack us. So, oh no, we need to, you know, come up with a little army and oh my God, they're attacking us more. So now we need our army to be bigger. And then, you know, that's one view. Jabotinsky is saying, no, that's that's not the way that the world works to some extent, right? If you want Zionism, you need to do all of the dirty work of Zionism. You can decide, right? This is Jabotinsky talking, not me. You can decide the whole thing is immoral. And so then great, pull out, right? He would probably even say, it's a more honest position to not be a Zionist than to be a Zionist and not think that this is inevitable. Now we can disagree with the premise of that, but Jabotinsky would probably say, at least if somebody is an anti-Zionist on uh, philosophic grounds, at, at least they're being internally consistent. But for Jabotinsky in writing in 1923, it doesn't make sense to both be a Zionist and also be squeamish when it comes to the militarizing dirty work of of Zionism, much, much the same way that, you know, one could argue, you know, it's hard to be a proud American without, you know, being a fan of everything the American military. I mean, it's a harder, it's a harder um, comparison to make. But yeah, I, I totally agree, Sylvia. Um, any other thoughts here? So just to, um, just to share one more um, thing real quick. So he actually, a year after he um, published this, and we won't, um, let me see. Well, if people have, I don't know if we have another uh, couple minutes. I think we're um, bum bum bum. Let me just find a quick source. If anyone has any other questions, um, feel free to cut me off here. So he he wrote a another essay um, in the wake of this, where he defended this essay because, as you can imagine, a lot of people attacked him and said hey, this is crazy and unethical. Um, so a couple of months later, he wrote an essay called The Ethics of the Iron Wall. Um, and he put some more arguments to defend um, what he was doing. So just uh, for people still here, I guess this is a bonus time. So um, I can share the, the larger essay um, in a minute, but he he writes towards, towards the end, whoops. Um, he says as follows. He says, let us consider for a moment the point of view of those to whom this seems immoral. We shall trace the root of the evil to this, that we are seeking to colonize a country against the wishes of its population, in other words, by force. Everything else that is undesirable grows out of this root with axiomatic inevitability. What then is to be done? 
The simplest way out would be to look for another country to colonize, like Uganda. But if we look more closely into the matter, we shall find that the same evil exists there too. Uganda also has a native population which consciously or unconsciously, as in every other instance of history, will resist the coming of the colonizers. It is true that these natives happens to be black, right? Of course, this is 1920, so everybody was uh, racist, but this does not alter the essential fact. If it is immoral to colonize a country against the will of its native population, the same morality must apply equally to the black man as to the white. Of course, the black man might not be sufficiently advanced to think of selling, sending delegations to London, but he will soon find some kind-hearted white friends who will instruct him. Though should these natives even prove utterly helpless like children, the matter would only become worse. Then if colonialism is invasion and robbery, the greatest crime of all would, would be to rob helpless children. Consequently, colonization in Uganda is also immoral, and colonization in any other part of the world, whatever it may be, is immoral. There are no more uninhabited islands in the world. In every oasis, there is a native population settled from times immemorial who will not tolerate an immigrant majority or an invasion of outsiders. So if there is any landless people in the world, even its dream of a national home must be an immoral dream. Those who are landless must remain landless to all eternity. The whole earth has been allocated. Morality has said so. From a Jewish point of view, morality has a particularly interesting appearance. It is said that we Jews number 15 million people scattered throughout the world. Half of them are now literally homeless, poor, hunted, wretches. The number of Arabs total 38 million. They inhabit Morocco, Algeria, Tunis, Tripoli, Egypt, Syria, Arabia, and Iraq, an area that apart from desert equals the size of half of Europe. There are in this vast area 16 Arabs to the square mile. It is instructive to recall by way of comparing that Sicily has 352 and England has 669 inhabitants to the square mile. It is still more instructive to recall that Palestine constitutes about 100th part of this area. Yet if homeless Jewry demands Palestine for itself, it is immoral because it does not suit the native population. Such morality may be accepted among cannibals, but not in a civilized world. The soil does not belong to those who possess land and access, but to those who does not possess any. It is a simple, it is an act of simple justice to alienate part of their land from those nations who are numbered against the great landowners of the world in order to provide a place for refugees for a homeless wandering people. And if such a big landowning nation resists, which is perfectly natural, it may be made to comply by compulsion. Justice that is enforced does not cease to be justice. This is the only era policy that we shall find possible. As for an agreement, we shall discuss that later. So he 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 goes on, but he lays out again. A, a moral defense of what he's doing. Again, we can take or leave the moral defense, but he's setting up, right? He, he's digging more into his premise that if we think Zionism is moral, right? If, if we agree with the foundational idea that Jews need a state and that that is a moral thing to achieve, and then we acknowledge the reality that, again, he is all too willing to acknowledge that anywhere you go to set up a state, is going to be an act of immorality, an act of colonialism, then the only way to achieve a justice is via an injustice. And, and you know, digging more into his point, right? This again, his words, not mine. He says, well, the Arab world in general, they seem to have a lot of land. There are a lot of Arab countries. And so out of all the people who this could be done to, right? Half a million Arabs, right? Again, at that time, it was half a million that are living in um, British Mandate Palestine, it's an injustice, right? There's no way to get around that, but it's a necessary injustice is what is what he um, is saying. And he goes on again to defend his point um, more and more, but he really did. I mean, I, again, the, the reason why I, um, whatever one thinks of Jabotinsky, and again, he's a complicated figure. And, and I, I do think that, you know, personally, this is my personal opinion, the modern is really right that grew out from Jabotinsky, I think, you know, has, has done a lot of things that are, are, unnecessary, unjust, right? And not even within the framework, right? I, I actually do think that Jabotinsky would be very upset if he were to show up in modern day Israel and see a lot of what was happening um, because that very much was not his um, his wish for, for what would happen. So I, I do think he'd be disappointed in a lot of ways. Um, and, and he was a serious moral thinker, right? He was not flippantly saying, oh yeah, we're just gonna show up and whatever, you know, ends justify the means. He really did, um, Think about this, and and again, right? He he becomes, you know, a a a very controversial thinker, right? So anybody who wants to find um, 
That was actually a, a couple of years ago. This is just one fun story. And then we can, I, I would love to hear some thoughts about this. Um, I was invited onto a podcast to uh, have a debate, uh, Zionism versus anti-Zionism. So I was uh, defending the Zionist side um, and the opponent, right, did something very smart. He came up with, you know, he brought a series of quotes from early revisionist Zionists about the Arabs. And he's like, you know, says this, it says this. And it, it, it was a very clever way to, to sort of, uh, put me on on defense it ended up being a great conversation but to some extent th this is i mean in 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 one view of zionism and this is the current right versus left debate in one view of zionism zionism is the liberal labor zionism and these right wing revisionists every once in a while come and rile things up and cause trouble in another way of zionism the revisionist zionists and the right is what is actually being realistic about the situation and worrying about military and you know worrying about threats and the left is off in la la land right you know think singing about peace but not actually being realistic about what needs to happen to continue the security of the state um it's also possible that both of these views are uh, have a little bit of truth right it's not it doesn't need to be a binary um but i would love to hear i think we have uh five minutes left i would love to hear some thoughts about um this this defense here yeah, go for it, Howard. I think it's a defense. I think if you read it carefully, it is exactly what the Arabs are saying. Zionism is immoral. It's just that it's not immoral to Jews. Yeah. It all depends on your conception of that any morality is reference to some field of interaction with other people. Because yeah. if there's somebody who's trying to kill you, it's moral to kill them, right? So it's it's basically the morality, anybody by definition who's trying to kill you in morality uh, is outside your moral space because you have the right to defend yourself, right? Mm -hmm. So, all right, we're, it's moral for Jews, okay? That's what he's saying. We think it's moral, therefore we are Zionists. And therefore, to rule out any kind of action against anyone who's not a Zionist is, is, is not consistent with being a Zionist. And since Zionism is moral, that makes whatever those actions are moral. So, yeah. yeah, there was you a know what? And the Arabs can say exactly the same thing from their point of view. And in fact, that's what they do say. They say, look, Zionism is immoral because we get killed and we do that. You know, by the way, we're saying it's moral because we have gotten killed and all this. You know, yeah, no, that, you're 100 percent right. And the reason, the reason why I actually think Jabotinsky is an interesting figure um, is that I think far before the Israeli left or, or labor Zionists acknowledge this, I, I, I really do think he's acknowledging the essential. He, he is legitimizing all of the views of, of Palestinian nationalism. I mean, right, like I, I think deep down, he, right, unlike labor Zionists or unlike even in, in you know, 1940s, 50s, 60s, where you have, you know, labor, labor Zionists to some extent who whose views towards, um, towards the Palestinian national movement is they're wrong, it's bad, it's evil, blah, blah, blah. I, I think Jabotinsky would have said, no, they're correct. We just... We're also correct, and therefore, you gotta, you know, th there's there's no choice for for reconciliation. And so, I, I I do think he was a serious thinker there. There was actually a famous um, there was a famous Israeli uh, writer who gave an analogy that may or may not fit in here, where he said that Zionism is likened to um, a man who jumps out of a burning building, which is his only way of uh, of surviving, um, and accidentally lands on someone else and kills them. And then, you know, anal analyze the, the, the ethics of that situation. And so the ethics of that situation are, right? I mean, this is in the words of this Israeli thinker, right? Again, not, not necessarily my personal views are, there was nothing immoral, right? No action was immoral, but the situation was unjust, right? It is unjust for somebody to be killed, but there is no target of, right? There's no blame to be levied anywhere. Right. The only blame that you can levy is, is on the burning building. And so, you know, the analogy is the rest of the world for the Jews was the burning building. Right. And for Jabotinsky's um, point, 
there, there's no future for Jews without, without Zionism, right? We can agree or disagree about that claim all we want, right? I don't know what, what the current state of Judaism in the world would be if it wasn't for Israel. I mean, it, it's very hard to know, right, in terms of what would have happened post-World War II and Holocaust and post, you know, Jews probably anyway would have been expelled from the Arab world, right, in the 40s and 50s and 60s, right? Like, you know, would America just become the only place, you know, North America, the only place that Jews live? Would America, you know, treat Jews badly? Would, is Akhada Am right? Would Jews just assimilate within one or two generations? But it, it, it presents a, right, again, all of, all of your points taken for granted. It, it's a very, it, it portrays Zionism in a much more morally tricky light um, than I think a lot of people like to think about it. Um, but Jabotinsky sort of like forces this view um, through. Any other thoughts or anything like that in the next few minutes here? For those interested in Jabotinsky's writings, he 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 wrote a lot. So you can, uh, you know, and any Google search, you will get uh, more of his his writings. Uh, go for it, Sylvia. But in fact, um, you know, um, the state of Israel didn't come back until 1948, and during World War II, the British who owned it. Um, or the British protectorate, if you like, um, kept refusing to let Jews in there, even though in face of the white paper. So, yeah, I mean, it's a very interesting question about what would have happened if, um, if we didn't get into uh, Palestine when we did and how um, um, the results of World War II uh, influenced um, the Brits. Yeah, and and even before that, just to 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 make this even more complicated, because uh, what fun would it be if it was simple? <laughs> what the reason why Israel was right? The British signed the Balfour Declaration, and then over the twenties and thirties, continuously did actions that highlighted the fact that they didn't actually really want the Jewish state, right? You know, there's a lot of international politics and economics involved, but they were increasingly passing white papers, as you said, and limiting immigration. And eventually, right, we know what happens. Eventually, Britain gave it, handed it off to the UN once things were getting bad for them. But the reason why things were getting bad for the British was because in the, as a result of the white papers, the Haganah, labor Zionist militia, their approach was play nice, we need to get our diplomats in Europe trying to convince uh, British leaders to let more immigration is. At the same time, the revisionist Zionists came up with their own militia. It was called the Irgun. The Irgun was founded with a direct in purpose to attack British. And so you had now British governmental encampments, right? The most infamous was the bombing of the King David Hotel, where I think 150 or so, right? I haven't looked up the number in a while, British families, you know, women, children were, were killed in an act of terrorism by the Irgun. As a result of that, right, if it wasn't for the Irgun, right, this terrorist militia, maybe the British don't leave until far later, right? Maybe they never, right? So, so things, things get complicated. Uh, Maddie, go for it. Um, yeah. One, I just think Jabotinsky is like a super clever writer in his, like, response in the ethics of peace using like the language of the labor Zionist party, like, or I don't know if party's the right word, but um, like talking about soil and roots um, because it made it like a lot easier to make parallels and connections there. Um, but also, I, I don't know if this is a question or a comment yet. Um, <laughs> the focus on like national self-determinism I, we read the essays really fast, but he's arguing that this will exist for both sides, right? Like Palestinians will also have increased national self-determinism as well as Jews, correct? No, like, like yes and no. He's, he's saying that that will naturally happen, but he's saying that we have to stop that from happening, right? Like that's, that's the point. He, 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 he does two things that the labor Zionists don't do. He legitimizes Palestinian nationalistic claims. And then he says, we cannot entertain it even 1%, right? The labor Zionists would say, we cannot entertain Palestinian nationalist claims 
but we'll entertain at 20%, right? I'm just making up some, mm-hmm. some statistics here, but like he, he, right. He, he was very much a, we cannot give any concessions because he didn't believe there was anything to give concessions for For him, it is a zero sum game for him. All, all of the conflict can reduce at least at this point to if more Jews move here, Zionism will win. If fewer Jews move here, Zionism will lose. And so he, you know, all the other questions were questions that would only be determined by by demographics, um, which to some extent he was he was correct at later on. Um, that is, you know, the whole debate in the 30s became about immigration. Um, but he, so yeah, I don't know if that answers the question. No, it does. I I'm sorry, I was trying to scroll and see where I could find if anyone else wants to talk. Um, Yeah, I don't know. I need to scroll through it again, I guess. Yeah, it 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 is it is called yeah, it's definitely something that uh right, maybe the, yeah, we 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 read through it really fast. So I apologize for the speed. No, um, it's not you at all. It's my awesome. Well, thank you all for, for coming. This is a fun conversation. I think our, our last class in the Zionism series is not gonna be next week. Um, it's actually gonna be the week after. So next week, Rabbi Marsha is going to do the Machlok It Matters, um, but we are going to be back here June 20, I'm just looking it up, June 26. Um, and we'll talk about uh, our last major Zionistic philosophy, which is religious Zionism, um, which is also a, a fun philosophy. Um, and yeah, we, we can start off next time by, by uh, talking a little bit more about Jabotinsky, um, because in a, in a lot of ways, this isn't... Uh, completely true, but in a lot of ways, the modern Israeli politics, the revisionist camp and the religious Zionist camp have uh, become increasingly uh, interconnected over the last 50 or so years. And so, right, this is a helpful framework to starting to understand um, contemporary Israeli politics and also um, religious Zionism. Have a wonderful day, everyone. And you as well. Thank you so much for a wonderful class as always. Thank you. And keep coming back to the collaborative which you're a part of, so. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.